2 Samuel 21, the second half of that. We'll pick up in verse 15 this morning. As you're finding your way there, uh, I'm sure you've heard this this story before. Um, I'm actually reading it off of Snopes, which I don't recommend. And they say it's false, so I don't know what to do about that. But it's a great tale of a very self-important aircraft carrier. It's pretty funny. So the transcript... Uh, This says the actual transcript of a U.S. Navy ship with Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland. In October 1995, this radio conversation was released by the Chief Naval Operations on October 10th of 95. The American captain says, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid collision. So from the the headquarters there, what do you call that, the helm, uh, the captain's area, he, he sees a light coming straight towards him and he has the radio men say, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid collision. He receives back a communication from the Canadians. Recommend you divert, wait, I'm sorry, how do you do Canadian? Eh? (laughs) Recommend, eh? You divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. The American radio man receives command from the captain, and he says, this is the captain of the U.S. Navy ship, I, again, say, divert your course. The Canadian says, no, eh? I say again, you divert your course. The American ship says, this is the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States. And you have to say that with a little southern, southern twang, America. Second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and a numerous of support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be taken to ensure the safety of this ship. The Canadians reply, this is a lighthouse. Your call. (laughs) Isn't that great? You ain't changing the direction of a lighthouse very well. Such a great, uh, formidable foe, aircraft carriers. You know, when an aircraft carrier goes out, there's going to be destroyers with it. There's a whole fleet that goes with it because it's value. And uh, this very formidable man, this very prideful person of who, he, who he's behind the helm of is saying, I am to be worried about, I'm to be feared, and, and I'm the one with the authority. Change your course. Interestingly, just came to mind, as we jump into this today, because we'll be looking at giants and the, the decease of the four remaining giants that were brothers of um, the, uh, or brothers or somehow descendants of Anak or um, um, uh, what is the Hebrew word there? The Rephaim, right? The Rephaim, the giants. Um, if you look it up in your Old Testament, if you look at the Hebrew word for re- giants, uh, it's different than those are Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6, but Rephaim shows up 18 times in your Old Testament. There's quite a few accounts with them. Uh, but uh, this legend, this lore of giants being very powerful, and uh, this little story of the lighthouse and the ship saying, change course 15 degrees. Remember, Satan himself, he not only masquerades uh, as an angel of light, and thus his, his ministers do so also, and he's very good at it. He's been observing things. They are finite beings, but they've been here a whole lot longer than us. Uh, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light, but he also, his name in the New Testament, Satan is a, a title. That's uh, the, uh, to be uh, an opposer of, I forget the actual word now, uh, but diabolos or devil, we, we, uh, when you break down Greek words, it's kind of fun, kind of simple. Jesus spoke in para- parables. Parabolos. Balos, where we get the word ball, right? To throw. It's to throw something in. Para is alongside. Jesus would throw in a truth alongside another truth, and, and people would go, oh, I see now. Or if they weren't following him and they just were along for the ride, uh, they, he spoke in parables that they would not see. And so they weren't understanding clearly because of the par- parable nature. Now, Satan, he is the diabolos. He's diabolical, but he throws in diagonally. Isn't that kind of interesting thought? That he just wants to take the truth and throw it askew just a little teeny bit. If he says there is no devil or, you know, uh, all these things, then people go, no, that, that's not true. So he'll take and he'll twist the truth just a little bit. 
So that's, that's one of his weapons. But today we're just going to look at the giants that were defeated. So in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 15, remember last week, uh, or last week, but last time in our exciting adventures through 2 Samuel, we saw that, and I, I didn't bring this up, but it's it just kind of pertinent in the whole spiritual realm of things that's going on. We saw that David's ex-wife, former wife, Michael, one of his wives, the daughter of Saul, uh, she brought up sons to Adriel, the son of Barzilla, the Meholathite. And those men were handed over to the Gibeonites because of, we don't know why exactly, we kind of assume because of their war crimes and Saul's desire to wipe out the Gibeonites. Again, we looked at a couple different illustrations of the Gibeonites and how whenever they show up in the scriptures, there's someone who's being an antichrist against them. And it's probably because we're supposed to see them as the tribulation saints in Revelation chapter 7 and 11. So anyways, that was, that was then. But what I forgot to point out was, again, in the lineage of Saul, there was Michael. Michael was the daughter of Saul. And again, the descendants of Saul, except for the good Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, they all perished. So there's no opportunity for Saul, which represents for us that old man, our old nature, the flesh. There's no opportunity for the flesh to sit on the throne, right? When we get to heaven, uh, none of our fleshliness will be there on the throne. It will all be, it'll all be Christ. And that was just something I forgot to bring up. But um, there was uh, that event, and then it just rolls into this accounting, also in First Chronicles 20, verses uh, about 4 through 7, um, about the giants being ended. Remember in, in the very beginning of the, uh, the Israelites' conquest of the land, they get there and God says, hey, send some spies in, right? And, and they go and they look and they're like, wow. Ten of them are like, there's giants in the land and we're like grasshoppers in their sight. And so God is showing us by example that when he wants us to enter into what the land for them was his promises, God's promises, when God wants us to enter into the spirit-filled life, there's going to be giants there. The giants pre-exist and it's got challenges. And one thing I mentioned last time we were together in this, in comparison the Gazaite giants who were consistent nonstop enemies of Israel, who were foreigners who came in and they're a special people just for wearing out Israel, right? Uh, then and now that the giants are created, they're allowed by God for one thing, their eventual destruction. The giants always fall, okay, in the biblical narrative. That's very, very cool. They lose out in the end all the time. And so we're looking at these Philistines now. Remember the, the first Philistine, that giant from Gath? His name was Goliath, and David comes along as a young man. He's like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? hold me back somebody, right? And he's just this young guy. He's just like, what a brave young man. And through his life, through the experiences that he had, he had killed a lion. He had killed a bear with his sling. And so he says, I don't need your sword, Saul. I don't need your weaponry or armor. I have what God has already given me to defeat the giant. And, and I made Ill, uh, illusion when we are talked about giants before in the past, especially when there's a multiplicity of them. There are things... Um, that end up in our life that are giant problems, right? Um, there's, there's, uh, and then there's, there's just the, uh, the fundamental fears. And so it's always good to just go, hey, there's fears out there. There's giant fears. They might cause you anxiety or uh, just whatever it might be. And they are defeatable. And that's one of the illustrations that's going on in the Bible. So the, the fundamental fears, if you want to mark those down, this is not a psychology class, but the, the fundamental fears are... Um, the fear of the unknown, the fear of death, and the fear of abandonment. And there's, there's also failure. So those are four. And we happen to have four giants that are defeated here. So that's, that's fun. Death, abandonment, failure, and um, fear of the unknown, which encompasses an awful lot of stuff. And I just before we jump into it, as we start our life, you know, um, 
whenever we get out the gate and leave our parents' house, you know, some people are like, you know, I ran away from home at 15 years and joined the army, you know, whatever, and, and they're on their own from that point forward, and everything is a huge obstacle. And some people, you know, they stay at home a little longer, and, but there's still obstacles out there. And in God's family, he gives us all that we need to overcome, right? His gifts are given to us. We, there's not a believer out there who does not have access to the Holy Spirit, right? And that's the, the wonderful thing about God's Holy Spirit. We ask uh, for forgiveness. We ask to be emptied, and then we ask to be filled, and he fills us with his Holy Spirit, his presence, so then we can have the mind of, of Christ, the heart of Christ, and things like that. Everything just goes better in that way. And so over and over again, we have giants. Now, different from the Canaanite giants that were in the land, they were already there, right? These are Philistine giants. And so Philistine giants, they come at us from outside. These are different uh, temptations, different things in our life that they, they come upon us. Maybe we never even would have thought this thing, but now there's this, this fear. It's just, it's just weird how fear happens. It's so weird how fear. I just remember something. Because we're all susceptible to it. Um, I get up here and I talk, and it's usually off the hip quite a bit uh, every single Sunday. And I haven't had, you know, just that where you're sweating profusely in years. You know, I've just, I do this enough, and you're just like, you're not nervous about it any longer. You go, okay, even if I fail and fumble, I might have to pause and look. But the Holy Spirit will, he'll remind me of things uh, to talk about, and we'll pull something together, and hopefully it's edifying. Well, I just saw um, a, a video that was from a transportation class I had. And all I had to do was give up, get up and give a three-minute presentation. It's like practice for giving a board presentation, right? And so you're in front of you know, your 30 peers from your class and then the, you know, the 20 or so representatives that are there from the transportation industry. And you're supposed to get up and give a presentation on what your project was. But there's this thing, there's this giant clock on the wall and it's ticking and you have three minutes. It's like, <gasps> a timer! <laughs> So I'm sitting there having an anxiety attack as I'm watching people go, and some of them do great, and some of them just botch. It's terrible. It's like, I'm going to do worse than them. You know, and it's just really funny how the fear of the unknown is so strange, how we can just be racked by it. And God, he has, he has victory for us in all these things. So let's just look at uh, the passage of Scripture. We'll read these seven verses and uh, break it down a little bit. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Wow, this is, this is David, our champion, and he's growing faint. He's fighting against the Philistines. Then Ishbi Benab, we mentioned this uh, last week. Uh, Nob means, you know, on a hill, a high place. So the throne of um, this guy, Ishbi's thrown on the hill uh, is what his name means. So, so these, these Philistine giants, they are rulers. They have their own area. They're the governor of their area uh, because they're big. Then Ishbi Benab, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, that's seven and a half or eight pounds, who was bearing a new sword, though, or thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. So David is going out to battle. Uh, he's wearied in the battle. Again, these aren't chronological. This isn't necessarily at this point uh, in the narrative. Um, it's just pulling all four of the Philistine brothers of Goliath uh, is what it looks like, uh, the other sons of the giant. Um, uh, whose name I mentioned, uh, Anak, um, possibly all the same, same brothers. Could be, you know, that they're just descendants and they call them sons of the giant. And so uh, David goes out to fight and he is wearied in battle. And this Ishbi Benab, he's like, hey, you killed my brother, right? And he's a formidable guy. To have a, uh, a spear with a bronze point that is seven and a half and eight, eight pounds, that's a lot. Take a 10-pound weight or something and put it on the end of a broomstick when you go home and go, whoa, that's, okay, that's not, <laughs> that's a bad design. Um, if you want to see, uh, there was a hoard, a cache of uh, bronze items 
found in Israel, and I, I forget where now, uh, but if you want to see, uh, I was going to have slides, but the internet's not working today, so they won't go up. But uh, go to YouTube and go to uh, Expedition Bible and look up Spearheads um, with that. And Joel Kramer does a nice little video. He visits uh, the Israel Museum, and he shows you these different things. 26-inch uh, spearhead, um, and that one's only four and a half pounds. So we're talking nearly double the, si or double the weight and size of Ishbi Benob's spear here, and he has a new sword. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, came to his aid, struck the Philistine, and killed him. And this is when David's men say, hey, you're, our, you're more important to us alive, and we, we've been trained by you, we've been encouraged by you, we've seen your leadership, that we can defeat the giants without you. Very interesting. Now it happened, verse 18, afterward that there, were, there was battle again, a battle with the Philistines at Gob. And Sebekiah, the Hushethanite, killed Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. Again, there was war at Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jair, or Regim, you know, there's a reason we speak English in this country, right? <laughs> Anyways, the Bethlehemite killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So these guys have very formidable, large weapons. Um, you know, I don't know if you remember back in, in Little League baseball, there was the big kid bats. You know, maybe that the coach, the 250-pound coach was swinging, you know, when he's playing ball with you. You know, like, I want to go use his bat because he hits it really far. But when you, you don't have the size and the weight and the strength to, sit, to swing a heavy bat or a 28-inch framing hammer or a 50 caliber you know, handgun or something like that, don't because it just is going to swing you around and, and you're not any good. These guys are professional soldiers and they've got weapons and it you know, accounts the size of their weapon that it's large. So not only saying that these are giants and that it's a formidable death and it's notable to account these things, but that their weaponry was large is just another evidence that these really were big dudes and uh, his spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again, there was war at Gath where there was a man of great statue who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he was born to the giant. So um, mutation of some sort, uh, other humans have more than five fingers on a hand occasionally, uh, but uh, this is just something that identifies the giants and uh, the bad guy in Princess Bride, right? Have you seen the six-fingered -fing man? And that's probably where they got it from. Well, anyways, so when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, killed him. So this is kind of fun. Shimei would have been one of the brothers that was lined up when David and, and everyone, well, when all of the sons of Jesse were lined up. And Shimei wasn't chosen, but here his son Jonathan, not, not Saul's son Jonathan, but David's brother Shimei, his son Jonathan, he jumps up uh, and he kills the giant. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David, by the hand of his servants. And so... That's it. The giants are defeated in this time. Now he's, he's prepared the land for growth. You know, it's one of those things in our Christian walk, we need to defeat the giants, right? We all have uh, the, uh, the giants that are in the land when we get there. When we start this life, we have, we have fears, we have anxieties, whatever it may be, things that we grew up with that are just hindrances to our faithfulness to God, to our obedience to God. And, you know, those Canaanite giants. And then there's the Philistine giants. You know, once the internet was invented and every flavor of sin is just accessible and, and all over, people have picked up a lot of Philistine giants in their life. And they're, they're addicted to this, addicted to that. They can't break away. We've always had the addictive chemicals and, and, and the world is creating more and more addictive chemicals. And, and the more they, you know, some states break down on it or, you know, hunker down on, on the use of it. Other ones illegal, make everything legal. And so the Philistines run amok, you know, in your population. And there's people who just can't get past these giant obstacles in their life. And God says, you can. God just says, you can. 
You know, actually, we won't look at it today, but when you pre-read the next chapter, the psalm that David writes, um, he is, uh, he's, he's showing, you know, that through obedience to God, we can have victory, and we'll save that for next week. But I would encourage you, it's, it's in the Scriptures several times, so it must be a very important Second Samuel 22 is also a psalm or a song of David. So it's very important um, for us to have victory in our life, and it's recorded multiple times. So these guys are here. They're giants, the giants that uh, harm you and I in our walk and our faith. And we see some similarities. Now, it's interesting. Uh, we don't see typology here, but we see contrast and comparison with King David and these giants. So let's just jump into that. Um, there is a battle, verse 16, Ishbi Benab, one of my favorite names. I don't know why. Shennacherib, that's one of my favorite names too. We might refer to Shennacherib today too. Ishbi Benab, who is one of the giants whose weight of his spear was, his bronze spear was 300 shekels. He's bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. So uh, this thing goes down. David is wearied in the battle and uh, our greater than David, of course, never is weary. Jesus, he never sleeps, never slumbers. He, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro, looking to encourage anyone who is after him. So our God doesn't sleep or slumber, but David as a man in this, you know, oftentimes foreshadow or contrast of Jesus Christ, he's wearied in the battle. But in this particular instance, even though David is wearied in the battle, uh, he's got something more. I would make sure I get his name right. Abishai here. Abishai is also in the battle. Abishai is one of David's nephews. His sister, Sariah, has two sons, and Abishai is one of them, and um, Zariah. Uh, he's, he's a tough guy, but he's out for David's protection. Abishai, the son of Zariah, came uh, to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. And at this point, there was a change in how they wanted David to do stuff. But Abishai, his name means present from a father. A present of my father. Isn't that, that's really cool. So, you know, um, they have this kid and they go, oh, what, a, what a gift of God. Let's, let's name him that. And it, it just reminds me, we'll turn to uh, Romans. We'll do a couple verses off of this. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. And then as you're finding it, I'm sure you'll have a finger run across 1 Corinthians 15. So Romans 8, that should be that one of those central passages in your Bible that just opens up to automatically. <clears throat> what was my Hebrews verse? Hmm. That's good. Romans 8.15. Even though this is a giant, it's a very fearful thing. And uh, Abishai, his name means present from the Father. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So even though uh, we might be wearied in the fight and uh, the battle looks very difficult and very dire, God has given us, uh, he's given us a gift, and that gift is God's Holy Spirit, right? Well, one, I mean, there's, there's two gifts there that we get to call God Father. We get to call him Father Luke uh, 11 too. We say, our Father who art in heaven, right? We have a heavenly Father, we no longer uh, come to him distant with a, a name that, as the Israelites, they, they wouldn't pronounce the name of God, you know, they would write G hyphen D, you know, so they'd get rid of the, the O there, the vowel, so you wouldn't know how to pronounce it. We don't have that any longer. Jesus introduces his Father to us as our Father, our Father who is in heaven. And when there's fear in our life, when there's some sort of giant thing, where do we go, you know? As a kid, we would go to dad, you know, in a, in a healthy household. We'd go to dad because he was the protector and the provider. And it was always good. And so we have this young man who steps up, David's nephew Abishai, and he struck down the Philistine, and his name is a present from the father. And so we can be reminded that uh, through God, we are released from fear. You know, let's turn with me to Hebrews 
chapter 2. This is kind of a longer passage, but it's just good. Good to remember, Hebrews chapter 2. The main verse uh, in my thought is verse 15. Release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You catch that? The fear of death puts us in subject to bondage, right? I, I am not going to put on a squirrel suit, a flying suit, and jump off a cliff because it sounds exciting. Why? It's not a bondage of death. I think that's logic right there. But some people, they're just like, they're not afraid of that at all. But there's things that we go, hey, don't get too close to that edge. Why is that? Because you might fall and die, right? So fear of death. Now, that's just a, a carnal temporary illustration showing that we all fear death. There is Death is knocking on each one of our doors. We're all on a roadway, some traveling much faster than others towards death. And there is a fear of death because it is unknown. And when we get there, we have, we have some knowns, and that's what the Bible's about. It gives us those known things that we don't need to fear death any longer. So Hebrews chapter 2, um, wow, verse 2 is a great place to start. Wow. Do I want to start that far back? Just a second. No, not that far back. Let's go. Let's go verse 5. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you, God, are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? Isn't that wonderful? In the Old Testament, they notice God's mindful of man and he takes care of man. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. So this is Adam in the garden and us afterwards that we are to take dominion over the earth, be fruitful, multiply. He's made us lower than the angels, but he gave the earth to us. And you've set uh, mankind over the works of God's hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So isn't that interesting? That we're lower than the angels, but he's put this earth under subjection under our feet. It continues on and says, For in that he put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that was not put under him, but... Now, we do not see all things put under him, right? You're going, I don't feel like everything. <laughs> not much is in subjection uh, to my authority in this life, Jason. What are you talking about? Well, we don't see that yet, but we see Jesus, right? That's what it says in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So we have the fear of death, but Jesus, as our forerunner, he has tasted death. He took a big bite out of it and was in the tomb for three days, and he did this for everyone, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering, right? So Jesus, he suffered in this life. We, we learn that he learned obedience by the things that he suffered, also in the book of Hebrews. So if we join with him through faith, if we are qualified or are given power to become the sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, we can guarantee that we will also suffer with him. But he has taken the fear of death out of the way by giving us this guarantee of everlasting life. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And, and that uh, it's in Hebrews 5, 8 that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name, my brethren, in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. I think that's just so wonderful that this is the Lord saying, here I am, I'm the sanctifier of these people who really need some sanctification. And he's not ashamed to call us brethren. And we are his children whom God has given him. In verse 14, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared 
in the same, right? So Jesus, uh, eternal in the heavens with His Father, uh, eternally beheld in the bosom of His Father, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but before the foundations of the world, they, they chose that Jesus would become a man. He would put on humanity. He would add flesh to His resume, if you will. And He did not leave His deity. He didn't leave His divinity, any of those things. He put on humanity. So He left. What did He leave, though, in heaven? John 17 Five, it says that he left his glory. Father, restore to me the glory that was mine before the world was. So he left his glory when he left heaven, but he kept his deity. And so he's, he's always been equal with God. He's always been one with God. But they are separate persons, and they have the same mission, same heart, but they are, uh, they are, they are God. It's not three separate gods. It's one God manifested in three persons. And it's very interesting. So... Um, let's see. How did I get to there? <laughs> I guess it was a video I was listening to this morning on another subject. Inasmuch then, verse 14, as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So Jesus uh, putting on humanity so that he could die, and through death he takes away the power of death. Um, that, that, that the devil has. He's taken, out the, taken away the sting of death and the pain of death through his, his death in our place and his resurrection. Verse 15, And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So one of these major fears, that, these giant fears that we have is a fear of death. And people can be very, very racked by that. When you think about it, abandonment ends up being so anxious for some people because if they're abandoned, they might die. If I have no friends, I might die, right? So people do bad decisions. They do terrible things sometimes to have friends. They will, they will uh, compromise on their morals and things like that. And, and it it's all revolves around this finality of things, this fear of death. If, if we don't have provision, we're going to starve to death and we'll die. Whatever it may be, um, what were those... Fundamental fears, fear of the unknown, fear of death, fear of abandonment, and fear of failure. If I fail, um, then I'll have nothing to eat and I'll die. So they all revolve around the unknown on the other side of death. But through Jesus' incarnation and his death and his ability to raise again from the dead and destroy the power of death, that is the devil, he's released those who have faith in him through fear, uh, fearing him and not fearing death, to release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So there is definitely a bondage uh, that comes from the fear of death, and we see people making really poor decisions with some of their friendships or joining gangs or whatever it may be to have what they feel like will be a protection and, and a, a comfort in certain levels. And so this fear of death is defeated and taken away all through what Jesus has done for us. I want to make sure that I, I do want to read a little farther. Verse 16, For indeed, he does not give aid to the angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. I think that's very interesting because in our wrestling against uh, principalities and powers, not against flesh and blood, God doesn't give aid. So the, these uh, giants, they don't get aided. The principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in, in high places, they don't get aided by God, but the sons of God are aided by Him. So we have such a great um, strength and power that we don't even realize. You know, no one would think, ah, uh, you're just a lighthouse, but it's immovable, steadfast. It brings the light and it can't change. It's the battleship that needs to change its direction. It's the giants in this world that are not aided by God, it's the sons of God uh, through a new birth who are aided. Therefore, verse 17, in all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is also able to aid those who are tempted. So in all of our temptations, whether, whether it's, you know, 
an anxiety through fear or whether it's a, a Canaanite giant that's, that comes upon you in some sort of decision that you need to make in your life, whether good or bad, our God is with us and he is able to aid us. And he doesn't do this lightly. He does this because he was a faithful high priest and he made propitiation. He actually stood in our law place. He actually was not found guilty, right? He was found, I find no fault in this man, Pontius Pilate says. So unjustly, Jesus Christ goes to the cross and he pays the penalty. And in that paying of the penalty, he also sets you and I free. You see the fear that once held us back from doing things that are uh, victorious for God, those fearful things are now gone and, and he is there to aid you. He even says, in chapter 10 of Hebrews, I believe it is. He takes no pleasure in those who draw back, right? He, he, there's no pleasure in that when we are those who don't... Uh, yeah, Hebrews 10, 39. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. So we have, if we will grasp it, we will have just like what Abishai has. He's like, hey, my leader, King David, our leader, King Jesus... He has defeated not only Goliath and all of, the, all of the giants, Jesus Christ has defeated the fundamental fears of life, death, the unknown, abandonment, right? We're never abandoned when we have Jesus Christ as our friend. And so we stand in a place that's just very good, very healthy, very wonderful, and we have, if you will, Abishai, this, this present, this gift of the Father, gift of the Father, the Holy Spirit, you know, and we all know this verse uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And so we have so much. And so what do we have this in? This is kind of a reiteration of what I was talking about. But in this event, when the people of Israel, David's men, when they see him faint on the battlefield and Abishai jump up and defeat uh, Ishbi ben Ab and uh, save David, they say, you shall not go out anymore to battle with us lest you quench the lamp of Israel. So David's life, David being alive with them, was their light, was their hope. You see, if the king died, then the men wouldn't muster around him. They wouldn't have uh, something to battle for. We have such a great hope, and people forget this quite a bit, um, and, and it's just interesting. It is our foundational place that we go to. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul makes a very strong defense of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in this entire chapter. Verse 17 is the, the main thought on this. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. <laughs> but Jesus is risen from the dead. And he's risen from the dead and he's seated at the right hand of the Father and he ever lives to make intercession for you and I. And he is praying for us and the Holy Spirit is praying for us. And the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells within us. And we are now called sons and daughters of God. And we've been made joint heirs and heirs with Christ in God. And we're hidden with Christ in God. And our, we are in Christ's hands and Christ's hands are in the Father's hands. And so whatever sort of giant obstacle comes towards us presenting itself in a way that brings us fear we are not to fear because there is so much more power uh, abiding in us than what the enemy can do to us so Hebrews, excuse me first corinthians 15 verse 12 now if christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead but if there is no resurrection this is our lamp this is our light, the resurrection from the dead. But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. You know, to just think that if they were ever to find the body, the ossuary of Jesus, the one they called the Christ, you know, and Peter, James, John, Andrew, Matthew, um, yeah, and then I'll name off a bunch of the other apostles, their names inscribed on there, we hid the body. You know, it'd be like, uh-oh, all that was in vain. But it's a wonderful thing, right? He was seen alive. Paul will tell us by over 500 people at this time, the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is historically more provable 
The resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is more provable through documentation than whether or not Alexander the Great ever even existed, right? But people will question it. They, they don't question it anymore. Uh, there's a lot of work on that. We won't go into that today, but um, all of the apostles within a few years of his resurrection were writing the same thing, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead in the, in the epistles. And so even great critics of the Bible, they say, Galatians, that's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't disagree with that at all, with, with Paul's testimony and how he went to Jerusalem and he spoke with the apostles that were there already and they all spoke the same thing about Jesus raised from the dead. So if there is re no resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your preaching, our preaching is empty and your faith also is empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise if there is no resurrection, if, if, if in fact he did not rise, if the dead do not rise, excuse me. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by many, excuse me, for since by man came death, by man, our champion Jesus Christ, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now I just have to stop and ask you, do you believe that? Do you believe that in Christ Jesus that after your heart beat uh, stops ha happening after your brain stops giving electronic signals, after there's, uh, you, have, you have hypoxia of the brain and there's just no more life found in you, that once the doctor signs that death certificate and says, uh, 4, 19 p.m., this date, that you're not dead. Do you believe, in fact, that you have just moved to heaven, that you were seating, se seated uh, with Christ up there? There's thrones that are established for us already and our spirit, our soul is already seated in heavenly places. And when we move from this life, that we actually go from this test. Remember that thing when that beep? This is a test of the emergency broadcast you know, system. This is only a test. This is only a test. This is only a test to see if we will go, hey, giant, Ishbi Benab, hey, Goliath, ah, you're big and scary. But my God, he's not a battleship. He's a lighthouse. He's immovable. I can trust him, and I can put my hope in him. If you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then you have something in you that makes you uh, with able, to, you know, able to withstand in the midst of anything. So, verse 22, though, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming, then Christ, excuse me, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Remember how it said in Hebrews, we are, authority is given to us. We are to populate this place, but not yet, but we see Christ. Okay, one day when he is done with the tribulation, we will come back with him riding on white horses. It'll be victorious, it'll be glorious, and it will be uh, a, a unanimous victory where Christ just wins. He destroys his enemies with the brightness of his coming and the word that proceeds out of his mouth. He is, he is absolutely in control over those things, and he will do rightly and set everything right. And then at that point, you and I, we will, in our new bodies, with our perfect hearts, conscience, minds, and souls, we will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years on this earth. And then, then heaven begins. I don't know what that's going to be like. It's going to be good. But he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And death will finally be thrown into the lake of fire. It'll be, be quite the thing. Um, and it says in verse 27, I guess there's more here. It's just so good. For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. So the Father is not put under his Son, Jesus, 
but Jesus will be submitted to his Father. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So we are looking forward to this time, this change, this transformation, when the manifestation of Jesus' kingdom, which he established in his first coming and still is, and we are his kings and priests, but we don't see that quite yet, and we don't see authority yet, but we see giants in the land, we see giants in our life, we see obstacles, we see troubles, we see hard things that cause fear in us and the, the desire to want to back down. But remember, that we are already resurrected in Christ, if you will. We are already seated in heavenly places. If our name is written in the Lamb's book of life, there's no, I, I do not believe there's any taking that name out of there. I, you know, if we are there, if we are His, we are His, and our destination is sure. And it's not based upon my performance, it's based upon what He has done. And what He has done is He's overcome the enemy, He has defeated death, He's defeated the power of death, which is the devil, He's taken the sting of death out of the way which is sin, and he's nailed it to the cross, and he says, now in me you have newness of life, that life is eternal, live it now, right? We have such a great hope that is set before us. And on all that, 1 John 4, 18, um, if you haven't marked this in your Bible already, you really should. John, excuse me, 1 John 4, 18, 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. The giants of our life, the giant obstacles in our life, they, are, they torment us. But God doesn't allow those in our lives to torment us. He allows them in our life for us to be victorious over them. And he gives them to us, and, and it's in his perfect love. There is no fear in, in God's agape love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And so there's an indicator for us. When you wake up, when, uh, when the phone rings, when whatever happens in your life and your stomach jumps and you go, fear, anxiety, unsureness, okay, wow, guess what? You're not perfected in love yet. Positionally, you are. In God's eyes, you are loved, you're perfected, but he says, wow, good thing we got a few more years of your life. I'm going to allow this to slip right into your life right there so then that sort of event does not cause fear any longer. And I'm not speaking from the other side. I'm not speaking from perfection. For sure, God knows the things that get us, you know. There was one day I was just, everything was great, and I was just felt like I was walking in the Spirit, and everything was wonderful, and we had a new kitten at the time. The kitten jumped out of nowhere onto my back and just cleaved into me really well. It was like, ah, ah, ah. Oh, it's a kitty. I had fear. Something's killing me. Right? And we all have those things. You know, the, I saw on the internet the other day this guy, this big bumblebee. And for some reason, it flew right up his nostril. One of those bumblebees. He had very large nostrils to fit a bumblebee up there. <gasps> what are you going to do then? You want to inhale to blow the thing out. But if you inhale, you just suck it in farther. I don't know. That would cause some fear for me. So there's things out there. There's natural things in this life. But there is the supernatural that is fighting against us. And God wants his love to be perfected in you and I. And that's why there's so many giants out there. One last thing before we kind of close in this. We notice that, that uh, one of the giants here, he had a new weapon. Oh, that's Ishbi Banab again. Ishbi Banab. It, it says, you know, that his... his Bronze spear was 300 shekels, and he was bearing a new fill-in-the-blank right there. There's no, there's no Hebrew word there. He's just bearing new, and he thought he could kill David. Now, just remember this. I, I, I believe that's left blank on purpose because you and I, um, we may not be too worried about someone coming at us with a sword, right? Because I'm in my F-350, <laughs> I'll just run them over, right? You know, okay, I'm just being kind of silly there. But we go, a new sword, big deal. There's many ways. I can just lock the door on my house, you know, uh, whatever it may be. We can defend ourselves. And it leaves it new there because what does the Bible tell us? That there's no weapon formed against us. Speaking of Israel specifically, but I believe God's people, there's no weapon formed against you that shall prosper. No new weapon. You see, the enemy out there right now, they're using technology. They're doing a lot of things that are very, very evil and wrong. And there's a lot of new stuff. What's new coming on the horizon right now? A cashless society. 
What's new coming on the horizon right now? No diesel fuel, no gasoline at all, 15-minute uh, cities. They want to use these things to strike fear into us that we say, you're the government, we surrender, so we submit. Now, we submit to the government as the best of all people as long as the government is doing one thing. They're supporting righteousness and they're punishing the wicked. When they flip-flop that, as it says in Isaiah chapter 5, woe to the people who call right wrong and wrong right, who call sweet bitter and bitter sweet, and we have so much bitterness in our world today being called sweet, and it's wrong and it's upside down, and we are to do what? We're not to fear an unjust government an unjust situation, we are to stand and say, this is the truth. And we do so how? With our fists raised? No. Paul tells us that the men are to raise up hands in prayer. And we are to, Jesus tells us, to be gentle as doves, wise as serpents. Correctly, but the other way around. Be as gentle as, you know what it says. Gentle like doves, but wise. Go by your senses. Uh, with, with the serpent. And so this is who we're called to be, and we're called to stand, and we're called to be victorious in all of these things, so much more than what the enemy wants to give us credit for. You see, the enemy, he continues barraging us, and he continues fighting against us. And in so doing, we often do not find an opportunity to sit and have peace with the Lord, to be redirected from the Lord, and to just know that everything is going to work out well. There's going to be weapons. There's going to be things that rise up. But I want, I want us to remember, God does not aid the evil world. God aids you and I. His aid is given through our study of the word and having our portion of the sword of the Lord hidden in our heart that we can use it offensively against the enemy. But then he also gives us the Holy Spirit and he gives us comfort and he gives us one another in the church body. And so God gives us more than what we need. Uh, he gives us more than we ever could ask or imagine. And it's all out of his mercy and his grace. And so we'll just close. There's a, there's a conclusion here that, that God is good. He's powerful. There are big enemies out there, battleship-sized problems, battleship-sized people, but the lighthouse is not moved. And what are we called to be? Jesus ultimately is the light. He's the light of the world. He says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. But now he's gone. So who's to be the light? You know, there's a day coming that's very frightening to think about once the church is removed with the rapture of the church, when it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that that which restrains is removed, then the Antichrist is able to reveal himself. And all of the plans, all of the framework we see for one world government and, and this Marxist, socialist, communist kind of on steroids control state that the world will be, because it will be chaos once the church is removed because evil will not be restrained any longer. We can see that it's going to change. It's going to be so dreadful and so terrible here on this earth um, because the Holy Spirit is the restraining force. But um, we have so much more. Turn with me to Hebrews, one last place from Hebrews chapter 12. We have such a power in God. And it's, it's not like the Old Testament. We have the law written on our heart. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the full counsel of God in his written word. We have the body of Christ, one another. And it's good. Hebrews 12, 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may not be touched, and that burned with fire and with blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they did not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched, touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you, we haven't come to that mountain of the law. You have come to Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels and to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. 
we haven't come to this Old Testament thing that tried us and tested us and was difficult and hard. We have trials and tests and difficult days that are hard, but what we've come to is Jesus, resurrected, ever living, right? Ever living to make intercession for us. And he is able to save those who come to him by faith. He's able to save them to the uttermost. That's a long way, right? And he is good. And so we need to, in the days that we live, there's so many, as we looked at that as the giants being the Gazans, and we see how that is such a giant problem in Israel today. Um, But God's got that. It's not beautiful. It's not good. It's war. It's always terrible when there's war. I am, I am uh, such an anti-war person, uh, but there's times that people need to step up and take care of business, especially when it's really evil. But there's giants out there, and God is the victor, and we find that victory. And, you know, it, it's amazing, you know, that either in life or in death, we're victorious, right? And so that's, that's good news. We may, we'll all, we'll all, unless we're raptured, we'll all die someday. But in doing so, are we going to honor God by trusting him? And that's what he asks us. He just asks us to trust him. And he gives us so many reassurances. If there was no resurrection in the New Testament, it would be like, I just don't know. But since we have such an assurance of Christ's resurrection and his promise to us that we will be raised with him also, all those who've died with him, they will be raised with him, that we have such a promise that we can have hope. We can just rest it right there. So when the enemy raises up, when there's some giant fear, some giant problem, what do you do? All right, Jesus, I give it to you, you know? It's, this, is, this is for you. When, when Satan knocks, let Jesus answer the door. I think that's always a funny one. But uh, well, let's pray. Father, we pray, God, that um, the things in our life, Lord, the trials that are before us, the trials we don't know about, These things, the unknown, the fear of failure or abandonment, the fear of death, these things that are all, they're very uh, big. They're very trying. Father, may we remember in all of them that you've allowed them to come to our life. You've allowed them to manifest in our life, either by your divine will or you've allowed it to happen so that we can be tried and we can be tested, not tempted, but tried and tested to see whether our faith is of gold because you desire, God, to bring us forth out of the refiner's fire and have us purified, to have us people that reflect the very nature, the very love of Christ, that um, we would be that lighthouse, that we shine the light, we show the way, that we're immovable, we're confident in who you are. And this is all very possible for us, Lord, if we abide in your spirit, we abide in your word and let your word abide in us. So I pray, God, that we would abide, we would trust, and Lord, that uh, ultimately we would love you more than anything else. Please help us to accomplish this in our life, Lord. Help us to see the temptations, the things that Satan's put that, putting out there in front of us that don't glorify you, God, that they're, they're, not worth, they're not worth taking the bait. But you are worthy of all of our praise and all of our efforts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.